Today's scripture comes from the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man of a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they sent before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. We are starting a new series today. Um, It's four weeks, not very long. It's called Servants. And there are two purposes for this series. Uh, The first purpose is we're going to raise up deacons in the church. And so you need to find out what is a deacon (laughs) and who can become one. And maybe you're thinking, I think I would like to become one. And if so, that would be wonderful. But uh, we want to follow God's word. And so it's an important development in the church, just as we had a process for how we taught you what is an elder and who's qualified to be an elder. You will get a say in this. You will nominate deacons, and they're going to be trained. The candidates will be trained, and then um, they'll be ordained, and, and then we'll have these wonderful servant leaders. So there is a very practical and important Uh, purpose for this series. That's one. Some of you are thinking, but what if I don't become a deacon and I don't know if I'm qualified to be a deacon? Does that mean this series isn't really relevant to me? No. (laughs) Of course it's relevant to you because um, the, the bigger and deeper and broader purpose is for you to think about servanthood itself. Um, Serving is at the very center of the gloriousness of what it means to be a Christian. It sounds really strange, doesn't it? If we live in this world, especially live in this, uh, in this city, you don't want to serve. You always want to be served. But actually, in Christ, we hope that you will serve and want to serve, and you will never not want to serve. In fact, I think I'm going to be serving forever and ever in the kingdom of God, um, in His eternity, and it's never too late to start. So that's what this series is about, okay? Let's get into it. Part one, the origin of deacons. So in the Bible, there's a place where you can see where it started. And that's what we're going to cover today, okay? The origin of deacons. Part two, beyond pastors and elders. Many people have a view of the church. It's primarily about what the pastors do. And okay, now we have elders. I guess what's what they do. Not true. You see, especially here with deacons, God is pushing beyond that, beyond pastors and elders. And part three, the servant king healing our selfish entitlement. That's the biggest problem, isn't it? The servant king healing our selfish entitlement. So let's go to part one, the origin of deacons. And that's what this passage is about. And so let's get right into it. And it's, a, it's an interesting and strange story and it's right at the beginning of the, the, the Christian movement, the first church. Jesus has been, um, Jesus has been resurrected. He then uh, ascended, you know, he taught his disciples and he ascended to heaven. And then there has been um, Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Um, Peter gave this incredible sermon. 3,000 people were saved, boom, just like that. So the church started off with, like, with a bang, okay? And people are getting saved left and right. And as that happens, um, there is actually a problem. And 
we, hit, we get to chapter 6, and this is what it reports, okay? Verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So let's just stop for a moment here. You already get a sense uh, what is uh, what's going on. First, um, the church right from the get-go serves widows. How about that? So the church is not just a place where there's religion. It is a community, and they serve the poor. And um, if you were, if you, if you, if you were been at Revive, none of that should surprise you. <laughs> okay, we had a, a lengthy and very important series where God demands His people that genuine justice is to love and serve widows, the fatherless, and and then as in a, and our brother um, prayed about it too. He called them immigrants or those who are who are um, who are uh, excluded minorities. And so that's going on right away. But there was a problem. And that is the complaint by the Hellenists. Uh, what, the, what does that mean here? So far, in the early church movement, everybody who has been saved, they're all Jews. The Hellenists are Jews who speak Greek. They have more of a Greek educational and cultural background. So they tend to be bicultural, but they are ethnically Jewish. Now, later on, what's going to happen is it'll start breaking those bounds and um, in the early church, the, those who are not Jews will start getting saved just as Jesus wanted. Okay? But right now, up to this point, everybody in, the, in this first church are Jews. But there's a cultural difference. And those people who are, not, um, who are not speakers of Aramaic, they felt that against the Hebrews, these are the Jews who are, speak Aramaic, um, were not doing right to the widows. So let's go to verse 2. And so the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So here we are serving tables. Obviously, it doesn't mean something like being a waiter, okay? It is about doing something that's a tremendously important piece of ministry. It is about provision for the poor, provision for the widows, very, very highly esteemed in God's word, and very, very pleasing to God. But it says it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. That's what um, uh, the 12, okay, by the way, let's just back up. The 12, so who are the 12? The 12 are the 12 disciples who follow Jesus, except for one of them. So if you know um, your biblical history, Jesus selected 12, and then one of them betrayed Jesus, that's Judas. And then later on, he ended up, I mean, they actually all betrayed Jesus. And they all ran. And Peter even denied Jesus three times. But Judas sold Jesus out for um, infamously 30 pieces of silver. And he didn't repent. He ended up committing suicide. So then later on, there's a story in, in, in the book of Acts how they replaced his leadership with uh, one other brother. So that's who the 12 are, okay? And so they have all the authority. They're the leaders of the early church. There's really only one church. They gather all those who were right there with Jesus, and this is what they say. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will point to this important work, to this duty. Okay, so this is, how, this is where it begins. Now, to, let me just stop for a moment. There are, some people argue that, uh, it doesn't actually say in here, diakonos, which is the Greek word for deacon. Um, but uh, I fully agree with all the Bible readers who say, what are we talking about here? We're talking about deacons. Okay, absolutely we think it's about, this is, where the beginning of the issue of deacons came from. And um, I want to just point out a couple things here. Number one, um, next week we will look at the classic text in the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3, which talks about the qualifications of deacons. I won't go on to that today. We'll go on to that next week. But here's one first right away, one very important qualification for whom we want to become our deacons 
and to be set apart, have hands laid on them as ordination for this very important role, which is that they'll be full of the spirit and of wisdom. Okay? So keep that in mind. First, right away, who do we want to be our deacons? Full of the spirit and wisdom. So imagine if this t is the teaching that's given to revive, it shouldn't, you shouldn't imagine it because right now that is the teaching that's giving, being given to revive. This isn't only for the first church, it's for all churches. So Revive Church, here we go. Why don't you select, hopefully we can get at least seven, maybe more, okay? If we can get, a, if we can get seven or more, that would be great. Those full of the spirit and of wisdom. Now the second thing I want to point out will be a point to this duty. Um, deacons, one of the important duties is mercy. Mercy that fulfills God's kind of justice. Uh, if you weren't here in our series, I'll just give you just one point about this. There are very serious threats from God. That if you do not take care of the widow, you do not take care of the fatherless, and of those who are excluded. Minded. These are the people who are oppressed. They regularly fall through the cracks in our society, and bad things happen to them. Um, that God has very serious, has very, very serious threats. You don't do this, just quite frankly, really bad things will happen to us. We will incur God's wrath and his curse. So, one of the first set things happens here is we want a set of leaders full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and they'll be given this very, very important role. Okay? Now, there are other important roles that we're going to talk about, but so there's the two things I want to say full of the Spirit and wisdom. They're going to be leaders entrusted to serve, but in a way that um, the pastors and elders don't. Okay? Let's go to verse 4. So here's what the 12 said. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I'll say a little bit more about that in part two. But the deacons will do this work. Hmm. Very important men. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. So remember, there's like, <laughs> there's thousands of people. They gathered everybody. This is a giant congregational meeting, okay? They gathered thousands of people and they raised out this issue. Now, I want to just say a couple things about this. Um, number one, I hope you take congregational meetings seriously. We don't, we don't have a congregational meeting every day. And the issues that we bring to you in congregational meeting are very important for the church. And here, this was a tremendously important congregational meeting and a very, very important development happened in our church, in, in this church. And every time we call you to congregational meeting, we want you to take these words in and allow the Holy Spirit to influence all of you, all of the, all of the God's people gathered together, and this was their reaction. They were ple they ple what they said pleased the whole gathering and the unity built by the Spirit. And then we will raise up certain leaders who we will gladly submit to. We will gladly submit to. And these first set of leaders, these entrusted servant leaders, so important, the Bible tells us exactly who they are. So here are their names. And they chose Stephen. And they, it's very interesting. First man, and they told him, a man full of faith and of the, I always think it's really interesting. How come they didn't say that about all the rest of the guys? Right? But Stephen, um, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit. And then they tell you a bunch of other names. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus. Laus, I think that's how it's pronounced. A proselyte of Antioch. Okay? Let me just say a couple things here. Um, it's interesting who they chose. All these names, a lot of these names, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicolaus, they're not Hebrew names. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, if you look into the church here, so everybody's Jewish. There's already a kind of cultural, ethnic kind of, con uh, everybody's Jewish, but there's a cultural kind of ethnic conflict that's already happening, and the ministry isn't going right for those widows who aren't 
Aramaic speakers. But all of God's people up to this point, the majority of them probably speak Aramaic. They chose leaders whose names are Greek, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. And they said, those guys are, are going to be our deacons. So I want you to just feel the weight of this, that we're not picking people because they're our homeboys or just because we like them or they fit our culture. They are chosen because they have faith and of the Holy Spirit. And they are going to do important pieces of ministry works so that God's church and kingdom can advance and thrive, okay? Verse 6, these they set before the apostles and they prayed and they laid their hands on them, okay? Now, a lot of churches, we lay hands on people and so forth because we know that that's, there's a, a blessedness there. But this, this is everywhere, especially in the New Testament, Authority is being granted to them. And that's why we, we know that this isn't just any old thing. The names are set apart. They have this very, very special role. And when they lay their hands on that means they're being set apart. They're being ordained. Okay? And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests. That means the people who, <laughs> who are Jewish, they're actually starting to say, I'm going to follow after Jesus. But one of the things that we think is really important in the church is when we raise up people who do these ministry works, we're looking forward to Revive Growing, okay? People being added to our church um, so that we have these very important leaders who go out and do things that the pastors, elders um, aren't, um, can't do because, not because maybe they can't do it because they have the inability to do it, but because they have other things that they're supposed to do, Okay? And so let's go to that. Let's go to part two. Beyond pastors and elders, and I want to particularly emphasize two portions that we just went over. So let's go to verse two. That's the way the 12 said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Let's go to verse four. Next slide. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, why do we have deacons? Um, when I was growing up in the church, you know, um, I, it was a Korean American church, and the English congregation didn't have any deacons. They didn't have any elders. They just had a pastor. And, um, and sometimes when I was growing up, the, the English congregation didn't even have a pastor. But then when you know, they, the, the, the immigrant church developed, we got to have an English speaking congregation, they would have and a pastor for the English speaking, um, the English speaking pastor, you know what, they didn't have deacons and elders. And so the pastor is supposed to do the word, he's supposed to give you word and sacrament, and he's supposed to pray for you and sow the gospel into your hearts, right? But you know what? Then you read in the Bible, there's supposed to be mercy, and who's going to run, you know. AAV, who's going to look at the finances? There's all kinds of other things to do in the church. But you know what? Because we didn't have that office, we didn't have anybody who was authorized, who was entrusted to do those pieces of work, you know who I often fell to? I fell to the pastor. <laughs> and you know what that meant? Is that meant now more and more work was being put on your pastor, and then the pastor, well, if he were going to say, you know, let's do, be really, really good at mercy ministry. So I, I want to say something that's really kind of sad to say, but this is really true. Immigrant churches that have like an English-speaking congregation because, you know, the second generation needs to have, you know, we need to have the gospel preached, absolutely, those who speak English. But then, yeah, they don't give them deacons and don't give them elders. Um, do you notice that those congregations are not very good at mercy? Because there should be a man whose calling is focused on prayer and word. Let me ask you something. Isn't that important work? Isn't that tremendously important work? You know, you can get non-Christians to help with widows. <laughs> but you can't get non-Christians to sow the gospel into your heart and pray for you 
and shepherd you by the word. So pastors and elders are here to do that work. And you don't want to take them away so that they have put more things on their plate. That work is so important that we need other leaders to do other important work. They are tremendously important works that are gospel works. So it's well, the way we put it, especially in our, in, in, our, um, in our Presbyterian circles, we talk about the ministry of the gospel in word and in deed. In word and in deed. Serving widows, is that not gospel work? It's absolutely gospel work. <laughs> but um, we must have people who's, who are focused on shepherd you, shepherding you to prayer and word. You know, you're, it's not just your pastors who pray for you. You know that? <laughs> and it's not your elders deeply pray for you. And I'll just say a little something. Maybe a lot of you don't know this. Do you know that your elders gather together every week to intercede for you? And if you have a prayer request, you should shoot it to them, okay? Prayer at revivepres.church. You know where it goes to? It goes to your elders. And they are men of the word, and they haven't gotten into it and has been set apart for the, the preaching ministry like your pastors, but they absolutely must be men of the word, and that's part of their qualifications too. So you don't want to take them away from that. Um, but this is actually what it says in our book of church, or the book of church is a, is a, is a law book for, for our denomination. It actually says, if you don't have deacons, the work of the deacons falls on the elders. <laughs> and I want to just um, point something out to you. Uh, we just raised up our elders. We have three wonderful godly men. And they lead in this church, and they're already doing things. Let me just tell you, my life, Young's life, Joe's life, we feel so much more because we now have new pillars, more men of word and of prayer to help shepherd you. It's fantastic. And they're thinking about and building structures inside of our church that we, as just the pastors, we weren't able to do. So that's fantastic. But do you notice um, that one of your elders is often... Like, I remember when I got back from my sabbatical, Damon was back there doing AV stuff, okay? And, um, and Johan was making coffee for you. And John would set up welcoming and all these kinds of things. And it, that's what it says in the book of church orders. If you don't have deacons to do all these other pieces of servant, then it falls on the elders. And you know, that's what our elders were doing. But... Is that a good and wise way to use their time and their energy? They have other work to do too. <laughs> Your pastors and elders have very important work to do. And these are all these other works. There are other people in this church that could do it too. <laughs> and so we are calling you now to prayerfully start thinking about that. Some of you, maybe you can feel the tug right now <laughs> as I'm talking. They're like, Man, am I going to become a deacon? <laughs> Maybe I should become a deacon. Uh, we'll talk about that. Who should become a deacon? But we want you to start to prayerfully consider this. This is for the whole, this is for the work of the gospel and for the, um, uh, for, for the advancement of his kingdom and for the growth of our church. The growth of our church in every way. Growing in maturity, going in obedience, and then, of course, just as the Bible says, in multiplying in numbers, okay? Beyond pastors and elders, we need different, a new, a different kind of entrusted servant leader. Now let's get to part three. I want to talk about serving itself, okay? Part three. And we're going to talk about the servant king healing our selfish entitlement. So in many ways, so this is, I'm going to give you a tight little gospel sermon here. This is actually the key verse of this series. It's Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And I'm going to give you a quick little sermonette around this passage where Jesus talks about serving, okay? And, and I know that serving, like serving, and maybe some of you grew up in churches where they're constantly trying to get you to do more stuff. I don't know if you noticed that in our church. We're not always trying to, we want you to do more things, but we do not guilt you. We do not 
Um, we do not try to make you feel ashamed and, um, and just work you. We could guilt you <laughs> if we wanted to. And guilt and shame are powerful motivators to get you to do stuff, but that's not how we want to do it. We want you to want to serve as motivated by the gospel, by grace. That's one of our deep, we, I'm practicing right now, we're practicing two of our values. One is we're gospel-centered church, which means we want you to be motivated by grace. And two, our value that we're going to move toward is that every member will embrace ministry. Ministry is not just of the pastors and then not just of the elders. We're going to have very important leaders, servant leaders, deacons, but it's actually every member of ministry is what we long for in this church. That's what the Bible teaches. So let's look at this passage and we'll, let's close out today's message, okay? Verse 42 of Mark. Jesus called them, that is disciples, and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And again, Gentiles is all those people who aren't following after God. And this is in the context where the disciples, they're arguing about who's better among them. Okay, well, I'm, I'm better. Yeah, hey, dude, sit over here because I'm, I'm, I'm better. I get, the, I get the closer seat next to Jesus. That's what they're arguing about. <laughs> you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones, that means their better ones, their stronger ones, uh, exercise authority over them. Verse 43, but it shall not be so among you plural you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be, and this is crazy, this is the word he uses, slave. Slave of all. That's the word he uses. And here's the verse, that's the theme verse for this series. And if you would memorize this verse, it made me very, very happy. Anybody who's ever done LOLMD, Life on Life Mission Discipleship, which is, which is discipleship training in our church, you memorize this verse, okay? And today I remind you to remember it and keep it to memory and let's let it live inside your heart, okay? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Um, here's the way I want to talk about um, this is an absolutely this teaching from Jesus you know what he's doing he's completely flipping the world upside down these words are intended to take all the structure and the ways that our hearts habitually operates and to dump it on its head so he says this absolutely bonkers, ridiculous thing. Whoever would be great among you, must be, must be first among you, must be slave of all. <laughs> and so you're going, I, I don't really want to be a slave of anybody. And I don't really want to be a slave. And Jesus is saying, but if you really want to be great and you want to be first, you will serve. <laughs> we should not just seek to want to be served, because that's, that's how we are in our society, right? Uh, it's always it's the American way. Why do you go and uh, get all this work hard in your education? So you can go to the better school. You go to the better school so that you can make more money. And then you can go. You want to go up in your company. You make more money so that you don't serve. You will be served. Uh, you, you all, I mean, I kind of have a little dream of this too. I would love to have enough money one day and hire some way to clean my house, right? So I don't have to clean my house. Now, there's some practical like wisdom to that, but it's also just something super basic. We, we want to be served and not to serve. But here is how the kingdom of, this is the kingdom, the eternal kingdom so the way it works today in Silicon Valley and in America, the way I want to be served and not to serve, and everybody who does the serving, they're down there. They're down there. I even had to say to you, wait, uh, you know, wait, wait, to, to wait tables, and wait, I have to like, kind of push that away from you because we're like, okay, that's not, that's not important. It's actually really important. To serve widows, tremendously important. And 
Um, and when it says here, whoever would be first on you, among you must be slave of all. Who is Jesus talking about there? Hmm. It's really interesting. He is saying that to his disciples. And they're operating inside of the 20, like just the same values as us. I want to be served. You, you, dude, you can sit down there. I'm, 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 I'm better. <laughs> and so you do that scut work. You do the bottom stuff because I'm closer to Jesus. I'm above. But Jesus, when he says, who will be first will be slave of all, and you know, he knows that's going to be him. <laughs> and then he says it. I did not come to be served. I came to serve. You know who I came to serve? I came to serve you. You know, I came to serve to give up my life. The greatest greatness in eternity looks like this. And this is very strange because we are so set the other way. And we always only think about my values today. And I want to really just challenge you to think about this. Is your life, in, what is the horizon of your life? Your job, you want to live to 100 years old? And to 100 years old, your, your goal is to retire early, <laughs> to be served and not to serve? Huh? Is that your goal in life? Then um, this is kind of a tough thing to say. But it's actually kindness. And let me just be blunt about it. And you know I'm not afraid to be blunt. And I'm, being, I'm trying to be gentle. But if this is your goal in life, you're a bad person. <laughs> if all you want is to be served and not to serve and give up your life, then you're a pretty bad person. Everybody in America thinks this is how we are. But then it's strange. They, none of them think that they're a bad person. But here's the way of heaven. Real greatness in heaven is to serve, even the lowest, to be a, even be a slave of all. Jesus came to serve you in the most, even the most costly and wretched of ways. And he served you so much that you, though you're a bad person who only wants to be served, you actually make you and your way and my way, how we do it, this desire, we're making the earth like hell. But Jesus came to make the earth more like heaven. He became the first citizen of heaven, and he came to serve. <laughs> so here's the way I want you to think about this. Your soul is always trying to fill itself up by getting other people to like accuse you. Serve me. But I want you to think about this, that the next time you, you do that, would you say, you know, actually, this is not being great. This is actually being really quite wicked. This is the way of hell, not the way of heaven. Let me set my eyes on the first citizen the greatest of all, who came to serve me, though I did not deserve it. It really cost them big. And if you would take a step to say, I would like to serve and give, you know what you're doing? You're taking a step in Christ to crucify that bad, hellish person in you. You may not even feel good at the beginning. You think Jesus says, like, wow, you know, yeah, I'm just going to go to the cross. That's going to feel great. You may not even always feel good. And it's pretty tough when the people are very thankless. But you and I are very thankless to Jesus. But as he served on that cross, there was greatness on that cross. And all of the hellishness of selfish entitlement is being washed away on that cross. And could you think about this? That you will say, 
Hmm. Servanthood is the pathway to heavenly greatness. And it will be my way to lose my selfish entitlement. And I want to ask you of this. If you only think serving is just bad, <laughs> there's this remarkable thing that said that Jesus despised the shame of the cross, but he did it for joy. He served for joy. And I'll just close my message with this, this thought. Um, when I was a young man, I always wanted to be served. I still often always want to be served. But um, I became a pastor. And you know what I found out about being a pastor? You are leading. Some, some people think you're the pastor. You can tell people what to do, and then they have to follow you. OK? Um, it's not how it works. I found out that being the pastor is serving. <laughs> and serving sometimes when people are quite thankless and their lives are falling apart. And it can be quite costly and painful. And then I did it for a while because I'm a good Christian. And I'm, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> right? And then I burnt out. And then I wanted to run away from ministry because I started to hate people. And then I hated them for you know, reminding me that I don't love them enough and I don't actually want to serve because I constantly always want to be served. But then I had this other problem. I found out that if you got money and if you were comfortable, you got on vacation, and other people are always serving you because that's what we go on vacation for, right? I found out this thing that about three days into vacation when you're not working and you're just getting served, I just like get bored out of my mind. <laughs> and my soul was starting to get empty. And you know, I started to find out serving and pouring to somebody else and then watching them change and watching riches come into their life, you know, I started to find out riches started to come into my life. Sometimes you do it. You're putting riches in their life, and they still act like jerks. And you go, man, OK. You know what I started realizing? Riches would come for Jesus for me. And then something strange would happen. About three years later, I'd get a call, or I'd get a gift from someone who was utterly thankless three years ago. And then they would say, Pastor, I didn't realize it, but when you loved me and served me on that day, it made a huge difference. And then they would say that to me. Sometimes they'd give me a gift. Sometimes they'd just say that to me. I didn't need the gift, actually. When they said that to me, all the pleasure and glory of God would come in. And I began to understand this is serving. <laughs> There's riches on the other side. There's riches from Christ. And today, I hope you'll chase. And if you could do it, you can keep serving. And you'll start to find out, this is actually the stuff of heaven. After I go to heaven, I am not interested in not serving. <laughs> I'm going to be busy <laughs> serving. I hope that you will want to be busy serving. And it'll start here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, self-centered people whose souls are constantly curved in on ourselves and always wanting to use others to fill ourselves up, to be served and not to serve. But you served us in the most unbelievable way, in a way that none of us could have ever done for ourselves. You gave of your life. I pray that everyone who is listening, they would see that the power to truly be a servant, that, that is actually the pathway and entryway into heavenliness. To serve and give of your life willingly, gladly, 
steadfastly, undefeatably. Nobody can do that if it's based on their own legalism and righteousness. But if we find out that we are truly poor, looking for riches in this world, and we will serve with you, there's a strange secret, which isn't really much of a secret, but it shouldn't be a secret at all, but that you will make us rich. Jesus, nobody's richer than you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Your name is a name above all names. It's because you are the greatest. And help us to chase after your greatness and to serve those around us, especially the weak. And we pray, Lord, incredible men like Stephen and Nicanor and Prochorus be raised up in this church soon and very soon. And this church will grow in every way to your glory, to your praise, for your name to be magnified and for us to rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.